This is the 16th of June, 1983, and I have Eunice Pace and Yuba Franklin, her sister, and we're going to talk about Saluda in the old days, and this is Eunice. The people came here from the south on the train with no cars, and they brought their, all their luggage and uh, 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 suitcases and trunks, and Bale Pace was a taxi man, and he would taxi them home, and uh, all the people would gather at the post office every time the train would come, the passenger train would bring mail. We had four or five mails each day. And they would gather downtown. You think it was a little city. There were so many people. Daddy wouldn't let us come to town then because there were too many people. We were little. Too many people. Well, The doctor told my parents that they had to get me out of the tropics every uh, summer. And uh, Saluda was the place that they purchased this property. And we kept, we're coming up here every summer, and all our friends, uh, when you're in a foreign country like Cuba, uh, you know people that speak the same language. So we would explain to them how nice it was up here and we'd come up here and from time to time we'd bring one or two of them up with us and uh, once they came up here and saw how nice it was and experienced it uh, they would decide that they'd rent and then they liked it so well after they rented and came on their own for a while that they just decided that well why not purchase some property up here and have a place of their own, and that's what they did. I used to come down and uh, when I was growing up, 10, 12 years old, and help old ladies, I'd say, get off the train with their luggage and things, which I'd get a 10 cent tip or a quarter tip, maybe. And uh, it was very amusing to see all of the people come in from the south and uh, early spring and summer. I'll tell you what was a shocker though, when those irreverent tourists came up in the summer, they wore shorts. Quite irreverent. Pretty legs though. And you know, a lot of people say, oh that's a nosy little town or a nosy little community. But there were such few people that everybody knew everybody else's business. But if something happened, they was right there to help. Well, everybody here in Saluda, that was I was growing up, is practically, this is where they learned to swim, if they could swim. I can remember my grandmother standing on the back porch, yelling at them, because there were apple trees back there. Quit chunking my apples, <laughs> she'd say. It was a sleeping porch. There were two sleeping porches. Mother and Daddy slept in the far sleeping porch, the one we call now the tree house. And I slept in this little little one. And I would wake up in the night and you could hear the train coming up the mountain. Yeah, it was wonderful. It, it, I think I can. And then it would slow. I think I can. And then it would get to the top and it would, you know, I thought I could, I thought I could, and then I knew I could, I knew I could, I knew I could, I knew I could. It was wonderful. And we do miss it terribly. It's hard to talk about the church and not talk about my family at the same time, because my family has been in this church since the, the, it's beginning about 1800 when they first located here. Of the, our congregation on, a, on an average Sunday is about 50. And I would say that I am kin to about 45 of those 50s in some way or another. You've never been nowhere else. <laughs>
born and raised in Sluda. <laughs> um, well, our father was raised, uh, reared in um, near um, Greenville County, Glassy Mountain, Dark Corner. He bought the land here in Saluda and started a dairy. See, the Indians did not leave this area until 1788. By treaty, they moved beyond the Pigeon River, which is Haywood County, and uh, left this land vacant for settlement. That's when this land started being divided into uh, land grants. The first ones in that whole area were Joel Music, Robert Carson, and Robert Hughes. They got the big land grants up there. And almost all the old deeds will go back to one of them when they're tracing the title to the deed. Later on, a man by the name of Burl Pace, B-U-R-R, E-L-L. -L. Every time he signed his name, he signed it that way. He came up there. His sons and daughters came with him. Then he got a land grant up on the mountain where uh, in the Mountain Page area. Burl Pace's first land grant from the state of North Carolina some 300 acres, and it included the old mountain meeting house. Now that was in 1805, which meant that that mountain pace church probably goes back to 1788, 89. The drovers brought a lot of money into the area. There were a lot of stock raised in Tennessee, Kentucky, eastern Tennessee, eastern Kentucky, and western North Carolina. And the closest place to get them to where they could be shipped by boat was either Augusta, Georgia, or Charleston, South Carolina. So they drove big herds of them from Kentucky, Tennessee, Western North Carolina, through here, going down there. The Peter Goss family had an inn and pens, and uh, those drovers would come through, and these men would have cattle pen, horse pens, sheep pens, and things for them to put their stock in at night and sleep and eat in the inn. Uh, incidentally, they bought hay and corn and stuff from local farmers, which gave them an income. It's quite a business here. And you look out on the Buckland Turnpipe or the Howard Scap, either one, see a whole herd of horses or cattle, sheep, hogs, and turkeys. They'd drive big flocks of turkeys. Now they were the most unruly ones. The drovers didn't know where they were going to spend the night. When in the afternoon it just struck the lead turkey to go up in the tree, they all went up the tree. So they had to camp right there, wait for the turkeys to come down the next morning to drive them on. There was no Saluda when the train came. The, the track up the mountain was finished in 1878 and Saluda was not organized to 1881. So uh, they had surveyed the railroad, they had scouted out different places, and they had gone to Columbus and, and uh, 
looked at that mountain over on Batron Peak in Skyuka, and they found out that the ground was unstable. And so they came on this side and come up and basically followed Packlet Creek all the way up. And then when they built I-26 up the mountain, they found out it was unstable, and it took them eight years to stabilize and get 26 open. From Columbus to Tryon, it was years before they could use that road because there's so much water in that mountain. So it, those civil engineers who was Charles Pearson and Andrew Turner, Tanner knew exactly what the problem was even though they didn't have the modern instruments. The railroad did not have to get a right of way. They had the power of eminent domain. They could just put it wherever they wanted. So they shot it through Cornelius Pace's land. And uh, he'd been dead many years. His heirs had not bothered to settle the estate. But when it was noised abroad that they were going to build a town there, all of his heirs came out of the woodwork from everywhere, uh, all the way to Austin, Texas, and every place. And uh, the settlement of his uh, estate went on for some 20 years. Lawyers got most of it. When it was finally settled here in Henderson County, the family got half the money, a lawyer got the other half. And this poor woman lived in Austin, Texas. She kept writing about getting her part of her grandfather's estate. And uh, I don't know how many stamps she bought, but quite a number. They're all collected at the archives. When she finally got her settlement, she got $2.36. She had spent more on st stamps <laughs> trying to get it than she got. The first passenger train came up on July the 4th, and it was the end of the line. And one of the engineers had built a commissary here right beside the railroad. And when the people couldn't get on into Hendersonville unless they went by stagecoach, he built a hotel. And then hotels, boarding houses, inns began to spring up. And at one time we had uh, about 34 hotels and boarding houses in Saluda. A lot of the buildings, the inns, were just summer buildings. They weren't uh, qualified to live in in the winter. They was too cold. But some of them uh, may have been three bedroom that they would rent out during the summer. Most of them had the meals that was included. Uh, there was uh, different menus. Uh, in our Saluda history book, we have a menu from Melrose Inn, which was across the street from where Saluda Baptist Church is now. And they served elegant meals. I think that menu had mutton on the menu. And, and of course, it was a challenge, I guess, to have different vegetables and different meats, but it helped the townspeople because they sold them vegetables. They worked during the summer. Uh, it was a place of employment, and when the children were out of school, maybe they'd be 14 years old, they would go and help clean, help cook, and it just work, and it, it helped them to, and they were really working to buy school clothes. You know, everybody had to have new clothes when they started school. So the, and the girls would go uh, and help babysit. They would help uh, clean house. Uh, even some of the local girls would take care of the children. And a lot of them uh, moved back with these families when they would go back to their home. They would just go back and spend the winter with them. Of course, the uh, summer tourist was a big thing, but it was started as a railroad town. 
And I would say the financial backbone of the town for many years was a railroad. Well, they had the dairy, and uh, so they had to have a way to deliver the milk. So they went with the buggy, and uh, Ruth and Wayman, that's our older brother, uh, he was born in 1915, but he's deceased now. And Ruth and Wayman went with the wagon and delivered the milk. <laughs> now, can you tell them anything about that? <laughs> well, we just went all, <coughs> all over Sleuth and... Uh, Delivered milk twice a day. We'd get up in the morning and help Mama to barn, you know, milk the cows and everything. And she'd uh, bottle it and everything. We'd come back and deliver it and uh, get back and then go to school and go over there all day. And then I played basketball and we'd uh, then we'd come back at night and deliver milk again. So we had a right pretty. Good busy today. Ruby, the other sister, she's deceased now. She milked cows and Ruth milked cows, but I was left-handed and I never learned to milk, so I didn't. Milk. But we had to. <laughs> Ruby could milk with both hands. I never could. Ruby did that. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was. I had some cement in the uh, floor. And then we had uh, metal bars, and the cows were put in the in the bars, and they milked. But and uh, uh, then it was brought to the house. We had uh, a bottling machine in the bottom of the basement there, and uh, Mama would um, uh, strain the milk and bottle it. And uh, let's see here. That start with though she done it all herself. Oh dear, I hope I didn't stop that. <laughs> and there's uh, that, and believe it or not, I found a stopper that I had kept. I bet this is the only one in circulation. Oh, wow. And then we just put that down, bottled it, and put it in a crate and delivered. I remember walking to town the first time when I was about four years old. We had moved over on Patterson Street and I had an uncle that lived nearby, and he and I walked downtown uh, to, um, I don't remember why we went, but I remember walking down there. I was about four years old. And uh, this would have been about 1939, something like that. Uh, Gurley Lauder was a police chief in Slew at that time. He was town manager and everything. He kept law and order driving a little red A model truck. He took care of it, had a man follow him around. Uh, they called him, uh, he was a Johnson. He, he carried uh, his plumbing tools and he took care of the uh, city waterworks. And, and the chief of police was the one who drove him around. Uh, but he had that little A model truck. He kept law and order. At that time in Sluda, there were people that sold white liquor. There was a, a, a man by the name of Tubbs, a black man over there, that uh, sold white liquor. And I remember one or two people that bought liquor over there that uh, they probably wouldn't want it mentioned that they did, but they did buy it. One man went over there, he was actually became a city commissioner one time, later in life, and he went over there one day and he bought his liquor from uh, Tubbs and he started out the gate, and when he started out the gate, Tubbs' bulldog bit him on the back of the leg. Well, next day in town, the chief of police said, well, I heard uh, Tubbs' dog got you last night. So apparently he bought his uh, corn squeezings from Tubbs over there also. When Daddy would come, we could do things. So we would go down to Tryon, and we'd get on the train. Mother and the, the 
whoever was visiting us, because there was always somebody else here, and all of the children would get on the train. And we would come back up on the train, and the daddy would drive back up. He would not get to have this joy ride. But we would come up Pearson Falls Road, because that the train is almost, you know, is part of, you can see it. And it would be wonderful. We would hang out of the window of the train and wave. This was a steam engine. There would be the engine, and then there would be the helper. And it would be at the end. When it would go around a curve, you could see the, the engine in the front, and you could see the engine in the back. It, it was very exciting, very exciting. And Daddy would be in it, our little Ford coming up the road, and we wave to Daddy, and Daddy'd wave to us. The trains, they just were a part of Saluda, really. And, and my cousins, I had cousins from Charleston, and they would come through every year going up to a Canuga to camp, and then coming back, and they'd be hanging out the windows. They'd have the windows up and hollering as they came through or whatever. And the same thing when the war was over. And uh, just before it was over, troop trains came up the mountain and would stop. And, and I can remember those soldiers hanging out the windows, too. We would uh, go down and get on the steamship Florida at the pier in Havana and sail about six o'clock, it's about sundown, and uh, go to bed, sleep all night, and wake up the next morning and we'd pull, be pulling into Key West, Florida. And we'd go out, get off the boat, walk almost across the street from the pier and get right on the uh, Pullman car and uh, start up the railroad and uh, reach uh, Jacksonville early the next morning and uh, get off that Pullman car, leave all of our suitcases and everything on that Pullman car, go up to the George Washington Hotel in Jacksonville, get a room, because my grandmother was with us, she was elderly, and uh, spend a day resting in that hotel room and then get back to the railway station that evening, get on that same Pullman car and uh, spend another night on the train. And uh, the next morning meet my uncle, he's usually there to meet us in the state, at the station in Spartanburg, South Carolina, come up the mountain and get off that same Pullman car at the station here in Saluda. And there waiting for us would be Bill Pace. And, <laughs> and he, he would have his taxi cab waiting there. And uh, we would pile our stuff into <laughs> his taxi or he would bring some of it maybe afterward because it was too much for everybody at once. And I remember he and his boys would uh, pull up out here in the road and they would bring it down and go up the back stairs and they would hold it, have it on their backs, puffing up those stairs. And during the revolution days in Cuba, they'd say, what have you all got in these trunks? Bombs? <laughs> they were sure that we had something heavy. <laughs> the summer tourists were quite a big business, though. So. Not only could you sell them milk and butter and vegetables and fruit and everything else, you work for them. For instance, when I was in high school, I kept four summer homes. I did the mowing, I did the pruning of the shrubbery. In the spring, they would write me a letter and say, we'll be up at a certain time. Please get the house open, wax the floors, wash the windows, all that. During the Depression days, I had money all the time because I was keeping those four homes. Number one switch was located about a mile down from Saluda at the steepest part of the mountain. They had three workers, three shifts, 
And my husband was a relief worker. He worked when they had sickness, when they had vacation or whatever. And that, when the train started down the mountain, he would give a signal. Uh, he would blow one time, and that means uh, throw the switch and put me down the mountain. The switch stayed thrown up to the safety track unless they gave that uh, signal. And when uh, he got, when he threw the switch, then the light would turn from red to green. And he would answer with two shorts of the whistle. And one night, my husband was working, and he uh, gave, the man gave the signal. And he, he threw the switch, but he, he did not answer with the two shorts. And my husband threw the switch back because if they didn't answer, they were, he thought they was running away. And when they answered with the two shorts, that meant everything's okay. And so when he didn't answer him, he put him up in that safety track. And the engineer came out just to cuss him. And it took him about two hours to get it back on track to go on down the mountain. And he was sort of frustrated. He was on thir third shift. And when he come in, I said, they're just testing you. They want to see if you'd really put one up in that safety track. And he said, well, they got their answer. <laughs> put the girl in there to start with. Jack, one of the boys of Miss Lola's, talked to her mother and that store was empty and he talked to his mother and uh, letting him put the grill in. If I'm not mistaken it was uh, 56 or 60, I don't know, I don't remember the date, but I did. But uh, that's my hangout. I got to go there every day for some reason or another, but it just don't seem like a day if I don't go down to Ward's Grill and get my coffee. When you were a boy, what did y'all do to have fun? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> just about everything. We'd go out in a cow pasture and play ball on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, basketball or baseball, football. Bramble around through the woods, climb trees, I don't know, it's just all kind of meanness we could get into. Did you have real balls? Did you have real balls? No, we made our own balls out of uh, wool socks. We, they ravel good, you know. And, uh, well, we, we'd get a new ball every once in a while. Did you ever go to the Princess Theater here in town? One time, and I remember, I might have went more, but I do remember going to the Princess one time, and I don't know where most folks remember a dog named Ren Tin Tin. Mm -hmm. He was a star in this movie that I, I mean, it's a dog. Uh, and I remember that very well. Mr. Uh, Walt Parks, uh, an African-American man that lived here, sat over and on the stage in the corner and played himself playing piano while a movie was going. We didn't have a talkie at that time. The custom was work hard in the early part of the day, quit about three or four o'clock and go downtown and sit on the benches and let the world pass by. We had five passenger trains. Many people spent their time just meeting those passenger trains because mail came in on all of them. The big ones, the uh, Carolina Special came through at five in the evening and uh, a lot of people would gather down at the train station just to see who was leaving and who was coming. Plus going back to the post office then and getting their mail. You know, there, there were several grocery stores in town uh, and if you wanted an article and you went in one store and they didn't have it, then you'd go down to the other store. Uh, most of them carried shoes, 
They carried overalls. They carried pots and pans. They had a little hardware section where you could get uh, pieces of uh, pipe or whatever you needed. And even uh, they, uh, they all had a grocery store connected with them. M.A. Pace did. Uh, Thompson's did. Uh, Fred Pace had A.G. Grocery. And if somebody wanted something and they didn't have it, and a lot of people would write their grocery list and just send it in, and they, they'd go around and fill that grocery list and bring it to you. They delivered the groceries. And if you wanted something, uh, you had something on your list that they didn't have in that store, they'd go down to the other stores and see if they could get it for you. I don't remember when Ward Thompson's store was with the Paces. The Pace store was both sections. And the other store where the Thompson's, Thompson Ward store is now, well, the Caps and Saunas had, there were two stores. Caps was the grocery store, Saunas was the dry goods store. And I remember my, um, we, Mrs. Saunas was a wonderful lady from Charleston. And she had a son named Fairchild. And he was the best looking thing. He was in his 20s when I was a little fifth and sixth grade girl. I thought Fairchild was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen in all my life. I remember we were downtown. My mother loved cheese and she had had asked them to order her some rope for cheese. And we were downtown and some distance away. Fairchild came out of the store, called to mother, Mrs. Stoney, your Rocky Ford cheese came, but it was spoiled. And so we had to throw it away. Well, it was blue cheese. And that was the reason <laughs> the Rocky Ford cheese was spoiled. But they th we thought that was very funny. <laughs> my mother said she went into the um, store one day, and my brother Bill, <clears throat> Billy, was with her. And Billy greeted Mrs. Saunders and, and very lovingly, and he said he would like to get some of his money. And so Ms. Saunders told him to get his money. And he went over to the place where the drag, where the material was uh, stacked on the shelf, bolts of material was, and he reached around behind it and he pulled out a little handful of change and he got his money and he put the other change back and bought his Coca-Cola or whatever he was buying. Mother said, what in the world was that? And Miss Anna said, well, Billy, she and Billy had an arrangement. She was his his banker, and he would put his, that's where he kept his allowance, and she let him keep it hidden behind the um, material, and he knew where it was, and he could get it when he came downtown. <laughs> well, they had square dances, and mother and daddy uh, often ran those square dances, and mother, well, they helped with the concession stand, too. Uh, and originally they were in the library hall and then the gymnasium was built in the 30s and they started having the dances in the gym and there was always a huge crowd there and with the concession stand and two and between sets you could go out outside and cool off and eventually they put a big fan at the back door to blow air in to try to cool it off a little bit because there's a lot of people that used to come to that and some good bands. We um, we went to bed early and got up early. We were sort of to bed early and early riders. We didn't have no television. We didn't know. Radio. <laughs> well, we had a radio and maybe not at your time, <laughs> but I can remember the little radio and uh, we listened to Loman Abner and um, uh, Amos and Andy, and then you went to bed. As we said, we all played basketball, and uh, uh, Mom and Daddy would come to the games. I don't know how they had time, but they did. And uh, so uh, we enjoyed that. Now, I played, 
four years. We never did win very much because Green Creek had a girl and her name was Aline Cudd and she was about five nine or six feet and so she just stood under the basket and put them in and we we never did very I well. I had to guard her. <laughs> <laughs> My sixth grade teacher was a Mrs. Moore from down in Polk County, and uh, she taught me in the sixth grade. And up until then, I had read funny books, and comic books, and uh, the only other book I had was the Bible. It was hard for me to understand the Bible at that time. I was young, I mean. Uh, but she taught me to read good books. And she had a book called Evangeline. It's a of great historical value now, if you can find a copy of it. She loaned me that book, and from that very, uh, reading that first book, I love to, I always love to read, but I started reading good books. But Mrs. Moore gave me those books, and she'd bring me books, and then the Saluda had a library at that time. It's right there near the end of school. The library was actually owned by the Episcopal Church, and I'd go up there and check books out, and I'd take those books home. And I had to, my, part of my chores every day was to take care of the cow, take the cow and graze her. We didn't have a pasture, and we'd take her somewhere where there was, I could graze them. Well, if I'd get so, sit down against a tree and start reading, I'd get so absorbed in my book that the cow would wander off, and then I'd have to go hunt her. My dad bought a cowbell so I could, and put, Put on the bell. I still have the cowbell. I still, I've got the cowbell in my bedroom right now. It's the only thing I have that was when my mother and father split up and all oh, that's the only thing I got was the cowbell. And I still got the cowbell at the house in my bedroom. Uh, anyway, that way I could keep up with her. And I'm sitting there and the cow got, I, I decided that i keep her from running off. I, I was barefooted, and I put the, looped the cow chain around my ankle. And the cow got off down there, and she got in the yellow jacket's nest. And she threw that head up in the air, and down the hill she went. She drug me about a quarter of a mile down through there, down into the old road going down towards the lake, old city lake. And I mean, I'm being drug over bushes and everything else. She got more, more frightened of the fact that she's dragging me in. I couldn't sit up enough to catch his cow chain to try to stop her, and she's just dragging, just skinning the daylight out of me. And so, help me, Sonny Barber lived on Patterson Street, and why he was ever down that way, I have no idea, because he'd never been there before. But he's coming, walking up a road from the old city lake. It's a very isolated place down in there. And he saw the cow coming, and she just charged right on by him, and he saw her dragging me, and he reached down and got the cow chain and stopped her. Well, she just skinned me from head to toe. We would, would leave, we'd play in the woods. I have no idea what we did except we played in the woods. I, we climbed the trees. I know we did that. And we made playhouses uh, in the roots of the trees. We, we looked with little bits of moss were rugs and little pieces of glass were furniture and all when when there was another girl we we did that but i don't know what else we did except we were gone all day playing in the woods uh, i don't think i'd test my abilities now but uh back then i would walk around here and i would focus my gaze on tryon peak which is a Mountain down here near Tryon, yeah. and yeah. several others like uh, Stackhouse, and uh, I don't think that I could get lost. I would never get lost, and I, well, the years that I, we stayed up here, I didn't go to the Saluda school. Probably the locals had resented that somewhat, but my mother taught me here in this house. And about lunchtime, or a little, some, anyway, right after lunch, I was supposed to go back to class, I knew, but uh, I would go out in the backyard, and I would keep edging farther and farther towards those woods, 
looking back up at the back porch to make sure nobody was standing out there looking at me. And when I got close enough, I'd make a bolt for it, head for the fence, under the fence, and out into the woods before anybody could see me. And I was gone for the rest of the day. <clears throat> then another thing I remembered was uh, I got some some of the pictures. I got some pictures that probably not too many people have seen. I've got aerial photographs of the city of Saluda. Aerial photographs that I took myself with my camera leaning out the leaning out the side of a, of a little Cub airplane. The oldest town marshal that I remember is Robert Newman, better known as Bob Newman. I may as well tell the truth, once in a while he'd get drunk. They couldn't find him, but he made a good town marshal. There used to be a large settlement down by the depot. Any trouble started down there. They'd notify Bob Newman and he would start walking down the railroad, firing his pistol in the air. And Tommy got down there, he couldn't find any trouble. That's how he enforced the law. There was a certain man, I won't name him, who would get drunk and ride his horse up and down the boardwalk. They didn't have concrete. They had a boardwalk for a sidewalk. Somebody asked Bob Newman, why don't you arrest him? He said, you can't arrest him. You can kill him, but you can't arrest him. You can't stop him. So he said, well, let him run a while. He'll go home, and he did. Uh, that's generally the way he kept the peace. I think everybody always thought Will Forrest the barber was a character because he liked to tell jokes, and he, he was always... Uh, a funny man, they called, and of course he had the wooden leg. But he was born in Saluda, and then he went to work on the railroad, and he he was in uh, Helen, Georgia, I believe it was, and he had an accident on the railroad and lost his leg, and then, then they had wooden legs. There's a story about Mr. Forrest and uh, Martha's granddaughter, I mean grandmother, said they were talking out there when time at, uh, to one another and uh, Mr. Claude Pace was sitting there talking to a little boy by the name of Eller and Claude asked the little Eller boy, said, do you believe I can stick a pin in that? And this, by the way, Mr. Forrest was one-legged. He had a cork leg and uh, he said, you believe I can stick a pin in that gentleman's leg and him not even holler? The little boy looked at him and said, he eased up there and he stuck it in the wrong leg. <laughs> so Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mrs. Coates got a, what I hear, a blouse full of tobacco juice. <laughs> <laughs> there was a black barber named Isaac Means, and he had uh, several places, I think, over town. We've got a picture in, a, in the book that uh, you can see the barber pole, and two of the buildings was located right where the, our post office and bank is now. And they said that when he went to work, he, he had a top hat and tails that he cut hair with. That's the way he dressed. Judge Funeroy. Anybody mention Judge Funeroy? Judge Funeroy sort of had a mental breakdown, but he was on a Superior Court judge in Virginia when he got sick, and he had his brother was Dr. Funeroy here, and they lived out. Judge Peak. Yeah, Judge Peak. I don't know whether it's named after him or not, but <laughs> I don't know why it's called Judge Peak, but uh, he had a makeshift. The doctor had done, the, or maybe the both of them had done sort of a <coughs> makeshift house. <coughs> I can remember we used to go out there sometime, just walk up and talk to him. It was just real interesting. Uh, bed, the old, the old wrought iron bed frames up for railings along the 
that house and, and sliding from off of doors or trucks or something, sliding things, windows in that building. But uh, uh, Judge Funeroy always had him a, a, a sack and he'd sit it down and he'd hitchhike to wherever he wanted to go, uh, mostly to Hendersonville. And I didn't see his sack one day and I said, well, I'd pick him up. Well, he grabbed the sack anyhow. He had two chickens in it. And they were live chickens, and he was on the way. He was taking them somewhere to Hendersonville, but they got to flopping around and stuff. And he said, "Well, he'd fix them." And he stuck his hand in there, and I don't know if he choked them or what, but they sort of calmed down. They didn't. But he he used to uh, come by the house. He'd he'd bring gifts and stuff. He'd he'd bring old hoes. It was during the war where you couldn't get hoes and I don't know where he found these hoes but to, you couldn't warn them. If, but he, he'd bring stuff like that. Dr. Sally stayed longer than anybody and when he finally left Saluda he came to Hendersonville and became chief of the staff of Party Hospital. He always had a a flower in his lapel, and a neatly trimmed goatee beard. The story goes that he started practicing on Trown Mountain as a young man, and because he looked so young, the mountain people would not use him. So he grew that beard to look older, and then he kept it all of his life. But he was a very fancy dressed man. During the flu epidemic of 1918, he was so tired one day, he came to our house and said, Miss Jones, do you have a telephone? And she said, no. He said, good, I want to take a nap. And he jumped in the bed. She was furious with him. He didn't pull his shoes off. He was so tired, he just fell in and slept a while and got up and left. If you want to know anything about what was going on, who was in town, who was here in their summer house, or who had left, you went and asked Lola. Lola was the, the, the town newsman, and she just about knew everything that was going on. Uh, if there was a death in the, in the community, uh, they had what they called a flower list. And most people couldn't afford a 10 or 15 or $25 floral piece, which wouldn't buy nothing now, but Lola had this list, and she would put about four or five names on that uh, flower. If it was uh, a 1250, she'd put five names on it, and you'd go in and pay $2 and a half, but that was showing your concern for the family. And uh, Lola would tell you who was sick, who was going on a trip. She just about was the town crier. She knew just about everything. One prominent person that lived in Sluda in the black community was Phoebe Sutherland. She was known, she was a daughter of a slave. She came to Sluda as a young, a young lady and uh, she lived the remainder of her life in Sluda. She stood out in the community because uh, she was a healing person. Uh, she healed by put, laying her hands on people and uh, praying for people. A lot of people came from all over the country. Her reputation spread far and wide uh, by her healing ability. She was well respected in the community and every year on her birthday in the summer they would gather together down there and they'd put up sawhorses and plywood and black people and white people all congregated there for her birthday and eat and spent the day there celebrating her birthday and that happened every year she didn't distinguish between white people and black people she took any person that felt that they needed her services uh, regardless of what color they were um, she's buried out here in mountain page cemetery out in the little black section out there. She has a tombstone out there. It's easy to recognize. She lived to be about 100 years old, give or take a little more. But I remember her quite well in the community. 
a big white headed lady sitting in the table or high, uh, sitting in a chair and her, her hair was snow white and she would talk to their patients. She never charged any money but there was a little jar there for donations and most people that went to see her would um, donate uh, something in that jar. She also had medicines. One time uh, she got in trouble with the state or the federal about uh, selling her medicines. She didn't sell her medicines, she gave it away and it was all found out it was just natural herbs and roots. I used to deliver groceries for Mrs. Ward over here before Aunt Phoebe died and uh, she was bed fast at this time. She stayed in the bed all the time. I mean she's just like a queen laying in the bed. She's dressed nice take the groceries in the kitchen and unload them and go into Aunt Phoebe's bedroom and she'd pay me. Come out with a roll of money like that. And she really sold that medicine. Her son-in-law and daughter used to mail a pickup truck load nearly at the post office to people in New York. They'd call them. I worked for the telephone company for a little while, like I said a while ago. And of course we had a trouble phone and uh, I could listen in on different people. And uh, I've heard people from up north, I don't remember exactly where, but several different times, talking to her about medicine. And she would tell them to read a certain prescription in the Bible and pray so and so and take this medicine. She's going to mail them and it would heal them. Phoebe Sullivan had. Uh, two, three daughters that I knew anything about when I come here. She had more children than that, though. But the three that I knew were uh, Beatrice Blunt, uh, Lula Sullivan, and we call Aunt Birdie. And um, Miss Sullivan, Lula, and Beatrice were still following in the footsteps of their mother. They did healing and prayer and they were still giving out the, the medicine that uh, she had uh, made for years. Beatrice was in Washington, D.C. And I had the pleasure of going up, staying with her, oh, six months or so, um, to just see what was going on. I never actually have hands-on, don't, can't tell you anything about hands-on, can't tell you nothing about the business, but I know that there was a lot of prayer work, and I know that people came that, uh, knew that she could lay hands on and they did lay hands on people and people were healed. And justice here in Saluda. My mother's name was Pranicia Bolt and her mother's name was Kissy Rodell, a Cherokee Indian. My father was Alfred Cheek who labored in Lawrence County, South Carolina, in Dales Township. I have lived in that section until I was nine years of age, at which time Mother gave me a ginger cake birthday. We children played happily through the day. At night, being sent to bed, I got down on my knees to pray and fell asleep. Then my first dream came. Thank God, I was on a journey. A voice came to me distressingly saying, Phoebe, Phoebe, oh Phoebe. I jumped up and looked straight up. I saw two hands over my head and not a person to be seen. A Bible was between the hands, and a voice said to me, 
take this Bible and go preach my gospel. Not as a manservant, but as a maidservant of God. The text that I had taken was repent, believe, and be baptized, and thou shalt be saved. After this, I received power to remove pains and heal the body. Of course, anyone who lives in the mountains compared to the swampland of Charleston, Savannah, and Mobile, it's better off you know that. <laughs> but anyway, to get rid of the heat and the mosquitoes and sand nets, they all came up in the mountains for relief. The most signal group was the Spartanburg Baby Hospital, a rather large operation. They moved it toto up to Saluda every summer. And it was on the hill across the railroad in back of what would originally was the Tanner House up there. You could see it from Main Street. You could hear the babies crying from Main Street. The baby hospital was started by Dr. Smith from Spartanburg. Uh, and he knew that the heat affected the health of everybody, especially if a baby was born, it was kind of sickly. And he opened this hospital and he felt like this uh, atmosphere was good for the babies. And then later on, they opened another hospital, which was a, a charity hospital. But Dr. Smith came here in 1914. Well, they say that ozone is uh, uh, pure air, and there was only one other place in the world that had the makeup of our air, and that was in Italy. So some discount that, discredit that, but uh, Who's going to prove what is and what, uh, what's not? But Dr. Smith started uh, having seminaries for doctors in the summer. He'd have two-week seminaries, seminar, seminars. And they would be doctors from all over the United States and Canada that would come. The first one that he started, they wasn't but a, just a few doctors here. But then as it got started he would have Saluda full of doctors for six weeks in the summer. And he invented pablum, which was a baby cereal, but he would never take any kind of a, a rights to it. He said if it helps the children, let them manufacture it, let them use it. It's hard to believe, you know, that uh, the census of Forty years ago, said we had 715 people in Sluda. Today, we still have 600 and about 90 people in Sluda. I don't know the exact on the last census, but it, it actually decreased a little. But some of the old homes are still standing. Some of the there are new homes being built in Sluda, but most of them are for people that are going to come for the weekend and stay. They love this place, a simple way of life that we live. Coon dog day, they come home. It's like a homecoming day. And, um, but to me, it's home. I've had a chance to go and live somewhere else. I could have made more money. I could have bettered myself in a sense if I'd have went and lived somewhere else. Got a better job maybe, but I, I've been happy here. I think we had a good life. We. Uh... Uh, that was a time when a lot of people were having a hard time, and I tell you, Mom and Daddy really worked hard, but I never thought we were uh, deprived of anything. But uh, we had a garden, we had cows, we had horses, we had chickens, we had hogs, so we had everything to, uh, that was make a living. And somebody didn't want people getting in their backyards, I said, I've always had people in my backyard. As long as I can remember, there's been people in this backyard. <laughs> I mean, it's I got a lot because it goes up the mountain even, but I've got 
between four or five acres here, and it's it's just I don't I don't mind people being. I enjoy sharing what. I enjoy watching the children. My husband used to love to sit on the back porch and watch the kids. When we married, we had seven children, and five of my children live here in Saluda. I've got 20 grandchildren and 21 great-grandchildren. I have a daughter who lives in Tennessee and a son who lives in Arkansas, but uh, the rest of them chose to stay here, and a lot of the grandchildren are nearby. Some live down in the lower part of the county, some live in Greenville, but most of them are around this area. And I don't think they'd go anywhere else. So ever since I've been in Saluda, it's been a blessing. It really has been a blessing. And I wouldn't take nothing for it. The road was clay with cinders on it. And I was told the cinders came from the railroad. They, they bought the cinders or were given the cinders from the residue from burning the coal and um, wood. I guess it was the coal from the train. And <clears throat> it was deadly. If you fell down on that, you had no skin on your knees. And I never did. I used to... I can remember thinking the sign of being grown up was when you no longer had scabs on your knees because we had great thick scabs on our knees all summer because you'd fall down and into these cinders on clay and then by the time it healed you had fallen down again and had taken all the skin off your knees. When I was in my 50s and living in Florida I had a little bump on my knee that was bothering me and I went to the doctor and he cut it out and it was a little cinder. It, I had lived with the little saluta cinder for all of my life in my knee. I, it was kind of hard when I found out what it was. I wanted him to put it back in because it, it was part of my childhood. Johnny Kiner. And you're a city commissioner? I'm, I'm the uh, police commissioner for the city of Saluda. Been commissioner for, uh, this is my 12th year now. Can you tell us what you think is so special about Saluda? Yes, basically what makes Saluda so special is the fact that it hasn't changed essentially in over 50 65 years it still basically looks the same and it's the same I would say flavor 
hope that it's always had here in Saluda from the people. Uh, that probably the main thing is the fact that it has not been overdeveloped or uh, you have not had commercial downtown developed for the fact that we have a historic downtown section. And this enables Saluda to be pretty much like stepping back in time. My name's Fred Daisden. In your title? I'm currently mayor of the city of Saluda. Uh, my Uncle Roy was mayor here at one time, so I guess you'd say I'm a second generation there. And the interesting thing to me about Saluda is you're starting to see second and third generation families uh, coming back here. The city has maintained about a 600 population for the last hundred years. And, um, but you're now seeing second and third generation of those families coming back here. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to, to see those people and to see it change but stay the same. My name is Officer Brent Cantrell with the Saluda Police Department. And can you tell us why you think Saluda is so special? Uh, the community. Uh, since it is a small community, it is a very tight-knit community. A lot of good people here. Catherine Ross. Hey Catherine, why do you think Saluda is so special? The people. The people here are genuine. The people are caring. And um, it's just a warm place to live. Warm with relationships. I'm uh, Tangela Morgan Cervola. I'm Leon Morgan's daughter. I'm Leon Morgan. <laughs> I've lived here all my life and Daddy's lived here all his life. And I'm an eighth generation Burl Pope Pays and we're basically kin to about everybody in Saluda. And what I think is so special about Saluda, we actually lived at Mountain Page and we, moved, we bought a house in Saluda and sold our house out there and moved out here. And at that time, our children were little in school, in school, and they'd walk home and come back. And it's just been a great place to raise yeah, a family. Yeah, you never had to worry about us coming, you know, through town. We'd come by M.A. Paces and stop and see Boo and Eunice and get our candy, or whether it be wards, and we'd go into wards. And now we've had a business here for over 20 years, and it's kind of like now we are getting the kids to come in because, you know, we know their family and we know their, you know, their mothers. And a lot of times I'll get a lot of phone calls saying, well, have you saw such and such? Can you tell them to get on home? <laughs> you know, and which is good, you know. Hi, I'm John Morgan. I'm City Commissioner, City of Saluda. Actually, my wife and I, uh, we're in the travel industry and we travel all over the world and we've been looking for years for a place to settle down. So we were driving up the interstate. We got off the interstate and stopped in Saluda for lunch. And she walked into Ward's store and Charlie Ward gave her a big hug and she says, you know, I kind of like this place. And the two of us can live anywhere in the world we'd like and we, we chose Saluda. People are friendly here. They were very accepting of us being outsiders coming in. We've been here 13 years now and we love it. Having grown up in California where I didn't know my neighbors, this is paradise. 